Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Strange Pathways. I'm your host, Scott. It's a, It's been a week. It's been a week. My lovely wife, Ariana, is home from the hospital. We had a beautiful day today. We, we traveled to a, uh, a recreation of an old town uh, called Old Bedford Village. It was, it was just a beautiful day. It was nice to have my wife back. And it's, it's nice to get back in the swing of, of, of living life. I, I, have a, uh, I, have, I have an interesting fascination with the movie They Live. It's, it is definitely one of my favorite films. It, it feels like there's something underneath reality. And they live, if you've never seen it, fantastic film. Go watch it right now. So in the movie They Live, a, a man who's down on his luck finds a pair of glasses with special lenses that allow him to see the way reality truly is and not the thin veneer that everybody else sees. The thought of having some device to just open your mind has always fascinated me and this week i found out about one walter john kilner now walter john kilner he he was a medical electrician at saint thomas hospital in london and he he was there from 1879 to 1893 he was in charge of electrotherapy uh, i hear you out there what is electrotherapy it's the it's not what you think it is a lot of you a lot of people are thinking that it's you know electroconvulsive therapy and even though it is related to that it's not quite that so it's the use of electrical energy as a medical treatment and now it can be deep uh deep brain stimulator it can be that or it can be used as like the use of an electric current to speed wound healing. So there's a, there's a ton of like chronic pain, chronic wounds, musculoskeletal conditions that electrotherapy is used for. And there's some bunkum. There's some, there's some quackery too. Now, Kilner wrote papers on a wide range of subject, but he is remembered for his late study, The Human Atmosphere. In 1911, Kilner publishes The Human Atmosphere, which he proposes the existence of an aura. He's using glass slides that he calls Kilner screens, that contain alcoholic solutions of variously colored dyes, including a blue coal tar dye called dicyanin. These were used as filters in what he called Kilner goggles. And he said that whenever you used the dicyanin goggles, the Kilner goggles, you could view the human aura he called it the etheric double he also called it the inner aura the outer aura it would extend several inches from his patient's bodies and his book gave instructions on how to construct and use the goggles the problem is the chemicals that the kilner were using were scarce and or toxic. The biologist Oscar Bagnall, he, he recommended substituting the dye penicyanol, dissolved in triethanolamine. This dye is not easy to obtain either. Carl Edwin Lindgren has stated that cobalt blue and purple glass may be substituted for the dyes. But there is this thing where a lot of people believe that dicyanin dye is currently illegal. I have looked and looked and looked. 
I cannot find any proof that dicyanin is illegal. I can't find a policy, a law, a statute, nothing. It's not a scheduled drug under the Controlled Substance Act. It isn't illegal to possess. Now, manufacture and, and, and sell, I don't know. I mean, is it illegal to manufacture cyanide? It might be. Dicyanin does contain cyanide in a less harmful form. These goggles, though, there have been there have been people who have claimed to see entities that weren't there. Not just the auras coming off people, entities that weren't there, strange crafts and beings in the sky. If you look up Dicyanin goggles on in Google, you're gonna find a ton of stories. What I find truly interesting, his claims, Kilner's claims, yeah, they were dismissed. But not because people couldn't see the aura. Because they could. It was because it was asserted that the aura scene was the result of the viewer's own perceptions. They didn't, they didn't say that the R's weren't visible, but they said that it was insignificant. It was, it was a result of the goggle user's own perceptions, which I find weird. That's like, that's like discrediting an x-ray machine. Because it's, it's just, it's, it's seen by the eyes, right? It's like discrediting uh, stethoscopes because it's only, it's only hearing the noise uh, the, that the human ears can hear. They dismissed the entire phenomena solely because it was detected by human eyes. So we're going to go to England, early 19th century. The Napoleonic Wars are in full swing. And off the coast of Hartlepool, England, a French ship is spotted sinking. Now, like I said, the Napoleonic Wars were just raging. The good folk of Hartlepool rushed down to the beach. And, of course, all this wreckage from the ship is washing up. These people find the only survivor. The ship's monkey. Which was, which was adorably dressed in a miniature military uniform. Isn't that cute? Isn't that adorable? Now, here's the thing. Hard to pull. Yeah, most, of the, most, of the, uh, most of the residents had never seen or met somebody from France. And some of the, uh, some of the satirical cartoons of the time... Uh, pictured the French as like these weird monkey-like creatures with tails and claws. So the the residents of Hartlepool, uh, they decide that, okay, this this little thing in its uniform, it's a Frenchman. And it's a French spy. Now, there was a trial. <laughs> there was a trial for this monkey. And it would not answer a single question. It's, it, they interrogated it. It was angry. But it would not answer a single question. So they found it guilty. The good people of Hartlepool then dragged him into the town square. 
and they hung the monkey, which is not a euphemism for anything. It certainly sounds it. But they hanged the monkey. The They hung a damn monkey. And I'd like to sit back and think that such a thing maybe, maybe would not happen again. But if there's one thing I've learned in my, my life, it's to never underestimate the stupidity of people. Our next story takes us to Oakland, California, in around August of 1973. There, we're going to meet someone who originally went by the name Sarah, but her real name is Sally Chambers, and she has a husband, Richard. Now, these are keen followers of the spiritual teachings of George Gurdjieff. I did not pronounce that correctly. I'm not even going to assume that I pronounced that correctly. Now, George Gurdjieff, he's a well-known mystic and philosopher from Armenia. How well-known? Well, I mean, I've never heard of him. Maybe somebody else had, but... Purr, they... But he, they, they follow his teachings, and, and the teachings basically follow that most people live half asleep. They're not at full strength. And they, they have to practice special spiritual practices, which Gurdjieff called the fourth way. Now, Sarah and Richard are just frantic followers of this teaching. And they begin conducting spiritual practice classes in their homes with small groups of friends. And it's at one of these meetings that they and their friends come up with an idea of trying to use a Ouija board. Uh, they, they think it can contact them with an etheric mind that can progress their lives a little bit further. August 12th, 1973, they're contacted by a spirit, a ghost, an entity calling itself Michael. Now, he himself, Michael himself, he says, I'm not a ghost, I'm not a spirit, an angel, I'm not God, but a fragment of a larger, higher mind on another plane of existence. Michael seems to know quite a bit. He answers their questions very, very matter-of-factly. In fact, a lot of people go, well, they're kind of, they're kind of being answered almost like a robot is answering them. And at some point, he even proves that he knows secret or personal details from the lives of Sarah and Richard. As they go, this entity becomes more and more philosophical, uh, deeper, it, it evolves. It becomes more than what it is whenever it first meets them. And I don't know about you. I mean, I, I kind of do that whenever I meet somebody. Whenever I'm talking to somebody, it's like, you know, you're, you're kind of feeling out what that other individual is is kind of into you you feel in their protocols you feel feel how their how their mind works what might upset them what might interest them so it's yeah it, it's i can kind of see why but you would think if michael is this all-knowing entity he would kind of be boom right off the bat sarah richard and the group they begin to conduct regular sessions with Michael. And Michael reveals more to what he claims is the ultimate truth of reality and the human soul. Now, Michael begins to talk about the reincarnation process. Now, Michael says the human soul enters the physical plane as many times as necessary to cognize all aspects of life. It becomes wiser and approaches transcendence, consciousness. It evolves throughout each life. When the time comes, 
the soul emerges from this ongoing cycle of birth and rebirth to join a group of souls that form one higher entity of which one soul is only a fragment of about a thousand other souls that form a collective that exists as a single integrated whole. So this 1,000 soul entity has a higher intelligence that surpasses all of its parts. Each individual cell is like the souls in a large organism. Michael, this is a direct quote from Michael. He said, and I quote, Our name is Michael. This is for convenience, not the truth. Only a small fragment of this entity bore that name. We are integrated fragments of a larger entity, and we come to you from the causal plane, the non-physical plane of pure reason and thought. We were artists, bankers, barters, lawyers, comedians, cemetery guards, amateurs, governors, guards of various shapes and sizes, grave diggers, horsemen, jugglers and clowns, loot players, maids, mercenaries, merchants, misanthropes, military strategists, nobles, and women, peasants, priests, prostitutes, rebels, revolutionaries, robbers, students, teachers, seductresses, governors, street children, and witnesses of the most heinous acts of cruelty and the most loving expressions of kindness and devotion. They kind of went... This, this is something I find interesting. For a long time, Michael goes alphabetical. Artists, bankers, barters... And then he breaks. Lawyers. Back to alphabetical. Comedians. Cemetery guards. Breaks again. Amateurs. Goes back to alphabetical. Governors. Guards. Grave diggers. That's... I don't know what to think of that. That's, that's just a... Uh, that's just an observation. Michael continues, though. We offer a path to human understanding based on our own experiences. First as humans themselves in calm and turbulent times, and now as reintegrated fragments of the causal body, no longer alive as you know it, but still with a keen understanding of what entails behind itself humanity. This is how we have been communicating for about 100 years. Our goal is to teach an understanding of evolution on the physical plane so that the students can achieve some understanding of human behavior that will allow him to stop thinking about interpersonal relationships or lack of them and focus on personal life plans. So these group sessions, they continue. Michael's knowledge expanded, and this was st written down, and this was written down by the group secretary, Alice Hanna. These teachings, uh, they're, they're collected, and they become known as the teachings of Michael. There is a constant focus on unconditional love. Uh, Michael said this was the key to deeper self-awareness. Another focus is the ability to experience as much as possible in one life and to live without regrets. Now, as, as this teaching expanded, so did the group. The group expanded. And pretty soon, there are more and more groups. At one point, there were about a dozen groups receiving messages from Michael. Probably more. Probably more. Now... If you look for it, there was a book published in 1979 authored by Chelsea Quinn Yarborough. These are, these are transcriptions of Michael's original sessions. And then Sarah provided the transcripts, which spawned a series of three additional books. These books pushed Michael's teachings even deeper into the public consciousness. And this sparked the formation of even more groups committed to this philosophy. So this movement becomes really widespread. But it's, it's at this point that Sarah Chambers herself loses interest and, and ceases to conduct sessions with her group. She, she later said, and I quote, Our gatherings at the beginning, and I'm sure my friends Alice and Dick think so too, 
were fun and like big family gatherings. Often on weekends, 18 or 20 people stayed at the house for mega sessions. The money never came from hand in hand, as Michael always said that learning pays off. Then, in 1976, the atmosphere changed. I just lost interest, that's all, and started doing other things. I really missed the camaraderie. The group had an atmosphere that made them stick together. We came to meetings, whether they were here or Alice and Dick's, with snacks and stayed until the early morning. These sessions continued for many hours, with breaks for dinner and sometimes breakfast. Now, Sarah would occasionally join Michael's conferences, but was never fully active in her group again. But the, Michael, the phenomena that is Michael, I should say, had already taken on its own life, and others took over and led the movement. Michael's teachings still exist. Study groups can be found all over the world. Many, many people claim that they can communicate with this Michael entity. So there is, there is a series. It's, it's called Michael Speaks, the Sarah Chambers Legacy. And it's published by the Michael's Teaching Center. This, this remains the longest running and most frequently repeated channeling phenomena in history. It's inspired endless discussion and debate and reflection. But what is Michael? I mean, we know what Michael says he is. There's something comforting in the thought that maybe we do go on. But... Is that how you want to live out eternity? I've never really bought reincarnation. I'm open. I'm open to the thought. And maybe that's a bit, that's a bit selfish on my part, that I've never really bought reincarnation. Because quite honestly, whenever I die, I don't want to come back. Life's kind of tough. I don't really want to come back to this again. I don't want to have to go through losing my mother and my father again. I want to go on. I have suffered through this, and I want to go on to my eternal reward. I want a heaven. I want a paradise. That's what I want after I die. I want, I want to see the bright light. I want to see the tunnel. I want to see my mom and my dad and my cousins, my uncle. My grandparents, I want them waiting for me. I want every pet I had to be waiting for me. And whenever I get there, I want to turn around and see all the people I left behind right there. And that's the way I want to live. My afterlife. That's the, I guess it's the way I want to die. I, I had a terrifying dream this week that I was executed by being drowned. It was very vivid. It took me a long time to shake it off. And in, in the dream itself, I had reincarnated. So I was remembering what happened to me in a previous life. I don't want to come back to this. And at the same time, I don't want to be one cell in a gigantic body. I want to retain my individuality. I worked hard for my individuality. And the thought of existing forever scares the hell out of me. And the thought of not existing at all after I die scares the hell out of me. So I guess I can say I don't know what I want. Maybe what I want is to exist, to feel safe. Maybe that's what waits for me in the afterlife. 
I know the afterlife isn't going to be pleasant if my mother and father aren't there. I know the afterlife isn't going to be pleasant if all my pets aren't there. I know the afterlife is not going to be pleasant if my wife doesn't join me at some point. But there's got to be an afterlife. I legitimately believe that there is an afterlife. I believe that we retain our individuality in that afterlife. My father in... 1990 had a near-death experience my father was very sick the last three years of his life he would eventually die in april of 1991 this takes place in october and november of 1990 he had to have surgery on his lungs. His, his lungs were leaking air out through his tissue. So they did the surgery. And then a few days after the surgery, the food tube he has up his nose turns pink. He's bleeding from his stomach. Ulcers had developed all through his stomach. 14 to 15 ulcers for every square inch of his stomach. They had gone up through his leg twice, hoping to find the artery to his stomach so they could tie it off. There were too many to burn shut. They went down through his throat twice. So they decided to take his stomach out. It wouldn't be much of a life without the stomach. But it would save his life if he survived the surgery which the doctors were fairly certain he wouldn't. He's laying in the intensive care unit. And in a second, he's not in the intensive care unit anymore. My father said he was standing in a field. And all these people were walking through the field. You couldn't make the faces out on any of them. Except for one person. And he said he knew this person was God. Except it wasn't God like you see in photos. You know, like, like they're taking cameras up to, you know, hey, say cheese, God. He said it wasn't the way people paint God. It looked like God was the same age as him. He never said it, but I always took it to mean that, you know, whatever this entity is, God, if you want to call it Jesus, that's fine. That's the word he used, Jesus. But whatever it was, was the same age as him. And then he came back. And if it was just that, if it was just that, he came back and he bled to death and died, and died during the surgery. If it was just that, I would be an atheist today. I would have went, well, you know, his brain was shutting down, he hallucinated the whole thing. But something happened to my father. Something the doctors couldn't explain. As soon as my dad, as soon as his mind returns from this near-death experience, the bleeding stops. No one could explain it. His lungs start to work again. So whereas he's bleeding to death and on a ventilator, all of a sudden, he's not bleeding to death and breathing on his own. People were stunned. People were stunned. I don't know if anybody wants to do research into this. 
My father's name was Paul Mort. And this happened at Sacred Heart Hospital in Cumberland, Maryland. I had six good months with my father. And whenever the end came, that next April, it was very quick. It was pretty peaceful. That's why I believe there's something after. I mean, my father didn't pick up a glowing rock from heaven and bring it back. But I can't deny that what I saw was results. I can't deny that what I saw, I couldn't explain. And a lot of people who were much more intelligent than me couldn't explain. It's kind of hard to deny whenever it's staring you right in the face. Thank you very kindly for listening to this week's Strange Pathways. Check us out over on YouTube. Hit subscribe, like, click the little bell notification icon, comment on YouTube. It's the best way to get a hold of me. If you're listening on Spotify, Anchor, any of the other podcasts there, please leave a review. It helps so, so much. If you'd like to get in contact with us, strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. Or come on over to the Facebook page, Strange Pathways. Thank you. Be good to yourselves and each other. See you next week. Thank you.